All right. Welcome to Hair and Art, Film and Literature. So without further ado, thank you, producer. This isn't going to be a deep definitive dive on any particular thing. I just want you to get think get you thinking outside of your modern hair box. And along the way, we're going to point out some common tropes in literature and visual media that we don't need to perpetuate. Oh, hi. Um, <clears throat> as in clothing and fashion, we live in a marvelous age here in the 21st century where anything goes. Anyway, here in the 21st century, we can kind of get away with anything. Do what you want. You can be super fashionable, like little Miss Beehive here. As soon as we get that back up and running. And you can be a counterculture rebel like these punk guys. You can be uh, a little retro like Miss Rockabilly here. Or you can kind of do your own thing like the emo girl here at the bottom of the screen. If you want to be sleek and classy, hey, great. That's a fashion. You want to look like you hit your head with a weed whacker? Yeah, you do you. Apparently that's a fashion right now for some reason. So that's that's uh, the modern state of hair. So now let's do a little hair chronology. That's going to be most kind of most of what we do. So in prehistory, let's talk like biblical age. You know, people talked about hair back then. If you look in scripture, they talk about hair being a woman's crown and glory. They talk about the pitfalls of obsessing about your hair. You don't want to be someone who overdoes it with the ornaments and the crazy crap. So um, it's it's definitely vanity. Humans are humans. We are always the way we are, and people obsess over things. Uh, you can see here uh, these Mesopotamian and Egyptian images. Beards were in for men. Uh, as you as you reach maturity, you grow a beard. That's what you do as a man, and that's pretty much a consistency throughout most of history. And uh, grooming the hair is nothing new. In the Bronze Age, we've got these lovely bog bodies that were dis discovered in the early 20th century in uh, Ireland and ver various places in the UK where people were uh, ritually sacrificed or just died and they, th they threw their bodies into these bogs and the tannic acid in the bogs preserved them. So this guy is, you know, a couple thousand years old and he looks better than Keith Richards. So we've got his hair, which is also preserved. He may not have had red hair. The tannins actually turned his hair. All the, all the bog bodies have this beautiful carrot top. But what that does is it enables us to look at some hairstyles from that age. And one of the hairstyles from this Bronze Age is, for instance, the Subian knot. You can see this little bronze head on the upper left where you see he's pulled all his hair to one side and twisted it into this nifty little knot. And you can see the picture below the bronze head is an actual uh, bog body where someone has done a reconstruction. And you can see the Subian knot still on his head after, oh, lo, these many centuries. And then a little diagram of one way of, of doing that on the right. So, you know, I find it amusing that my first images of people doing stuff with their hair is a guy because, you know, it's just cute. Uh, the Chinese, if you look at Chinese art from early times, too, they did a lot of hair knot, things like that, too. Uh, you get into uh, early Norse stuff, Viking art. Uh, the image on the left is a carving on a church door, and you can see that they're wearing their hair kind of jaw length. It's It's long. It's not like a buzz cut or anything, but it is, to them, that's long hair. Uh, there, there are some TV shows out and popularizations of of um, Vikings right now, and they've got hair all over the place. And that's it's it's colorful, but it's not particularly accurate. The carving on the right shows Odin riding his eight legged horse Sleipnir, and he's facing the little figure down in the left corner of that uh, carving is a Valkyrie, and she's got long hair that's tied in a knot at the back of her neck. And uh, you can find gals on YouTube who've redone that, and it's kind of fun. Um, looks like it's in a figure eight knot. And I don't know if uh, you can either braid it or leave it loose and do that. But that's that was one way to wear, wear your hair back in the day. So let's jump up to, um, that's not what I wanted, Greek, <laughs> Greece and Rome. Uh, 
you start to see a lot of elaborate hairdos in ancient Greece. People are crimping and using hot irons and tying their hair up with ties. Both men and women, you would dress your hair with oils, various scented oils to keep it frizz free and keep it in place. Uh, the far right image is ancient Rome. And again, there's a lot of latitude there. You can have a pretty simple updo. Like it looks like a little victory roll with a twisted up knot at the base of the neck. Or you could go crazy with a whole crown of curls and crimps and braids and all kinds of wacky stuff. So there's that there. Uh, in You get into the Middle Ages, you're... you're four digit centuries now the 11th 12th 13th 14th century and for several centuries long braids are great for women and pretty much throughout history it is just expected up until like the 20th century that women have long hair men do not and, and if they do have long hair it's not as long as women's hair Long hair can mean anything from chin length to shoulder length or, you know, anything in between. But long hair for men, unless you're a Sikh where they do grow their hair and do not cut it um, ever. And they just tie it up in a turban. But and these women, anyway, back to the women, beautiful, beautiful braids. And not everybody has thick hair. Not everybody can grow long hair, as we all know, as women. And so a lot of times to achieve that fashionable, big, thick, long braids, you'd braid other hair in, whether it's, it was human hair or horse hair or whatever. And when you're doing the taping like they have on those braids, you can actually, it's pretty easy to add in hair. There are, again, YouTube videos that show how to do that. If you look up Morgan Donner on YouTube, she's got one where she adds in extra hair for her braids. So that's that's uh, kind of the Middle Ages norm for quite a while, whether the braids are down or whether they're coiled up on the sides of your head as you go later. Get up into the 15th and 16th century. The gal on the left here is Italian. Um, and they, they were great for doing the very smooth down uh, hair for women. And, and then even if you had a braid, it was dressed. It was wrapped. It was taped. It had jewels in it. Men have facial hair, just like in the prehistory times, uh, or actually at some point, like in Greece and Rome, it varied. You had young men were clean shaven to a certain point, and it almost seems to be this thing that happens over time where older men will grow out a beard and mustache, and so it becomes a symbol of age. So if you're writing or you're, you're you know doing visual work for theater or whatever, that's a way you can separate ages in a lot of different eras is have the older men have beards and the younger men be clean shaven. Uh, let's see. Um, we also start to see wigs. Now it's not that they're anything new. The ancient Egyptians, especially of the Royal casts, would shave their heads and just wear wigs. Uh, but the common people probably didn't do that. It's, it's an expense and it's difficult to maintain. Queen Elizabeth, as she got older and her hair got thinner, decided to start wearing wigs. And since she had red hair, she had red wigs. And Mary, Queen of Scots, same thing. She, as her hair thinned as she got older, she went to wigs. And this, for one, created a fashion craze for red hair because everybody wants to look like the, the movie star, the celebrity, the, the royal person. And so that was, that was a thing. Facial hair for men comes back in. And uh, part of that craze for uh, facial hair was due to a royal person, Francis I of France. This was, um, he was fairly contemporaneous with Henry VIII. He started a beard fashion. He had some facial burns from an accident and he grew a beard to cover up those burns. And all of a sudden everybody's growing a beard. So that's, that's how that kind of thing can happen. Uh, next slide, please. So now let's get into the 17th century and you can see we've got some of those people are probably wearing wigs. Most of it's natural hair. Um, it's not everyone feels like they have to have red hair anymore. And it's, uh, you can see that there's a little bit of variety, but may, by and large, the women are pulling the hair away from the forehead. Um, in earlier times, 
if you if your hairline was a little bit low, people would pluck their hairline to get it fashionably high. So that's a that's a thing that happened. So moving along. And also 17th century here, we see the dawn of really spectacular. Again, we get back to spectacular wigs for men. We're looking at what we call the full bottomed wig. Uh, this guy has the full on powdered full bottom wig going on where it's nice and beautiful and fluffy and fabulous. If you, if you're doing a golden age of piracy story, then you're going to have guys with big, beautiful hair. Usually, um, Oftentimes they would take some of it and tie it in a low queue at the back, but leave some of the front part hanging down, being fluffy like dog ears. That was a fashion. I should have got a picture of that, and I didn't because I'm lame. Uh, we get into the 18th century here, and women's hair, if you look in the lower left-hand corner, you can see that her hair is up, it's dressed, it's rolled back, but it's not crazy in the early 18th century uh, you can see the hair is fairly low to the head. The gal in the center, very similar. And then as we get towards the 1870s, especially in the upper class and royalty, it goes insane. We get amazing, huge hairdos that are full of feathers and jewels and wacky stuff and full rigged ships and you name it. It's it just I mean, I'm sure that was an anomaly or probably theatrical, the lady with the full rig ship. But it just goes to show you that fashion likes to go to extremes and 18, late 18th century hair was an extreme. Now, after the 1870s, it calms back down again. Thank goodness we go into the sort of um, this later Baroque sort of era, the sort of Gainsborough look with the big poofy side hair and big hats and and it, it calms down a little bit, but you get the floofy stuff on the side, and that's kind of fun, too. Uh, here we go into the 19th century. And uh, fashion calmed way down. We, they, went for the, they went for a neoclassical look with the women in those Jane Austen, very columnar uh, neoclassical gowns. They're very simple. They are wearing corsets, but it, they're not nipping in their waist. They're just pushing up the bosom. And they're going for that ancient Greece look. And so they're like, well, we want neoclassical hair too. And so they simplified the hair way down. And we've got a lot of curls. And we've got uh, a lot of just simple buns on the back of the head. Now, of course, everybody in the lineup I'm showing you right here is well off and upper crusty and wearing fancy hair. The average, the average lady on the street would have something much simpler. And we're also, with very few exceptions, pretty much starting to go into a generality where women part their hair in the center. Men can part their hair on the side, but women part their hair in the center. It gets so codified by the 1860s that along with uh, signs in shop windows that say Irish need not apply because we're going to discriminate against the Irish. We also see signs saying people, persons who part their hair in the center need not apply. So that we that's just shorthand for no girls so there's that um children's hair in the eight in the uh, 19th century is a great way to figure out who you're looking at again women part their hair in the center boys part their hair on the side so when you look at this image it, and through our eyes we'd say oh is that a couple of little girls because the little kid on the right is in a kind of a jumpery, blousey, dressy sort of thing. No, if you see, his hair is parted on the side and he is wearing a little suit thing because he's just a little guy and he's in a buttons all the way around so it's easy to get at his little nappies. But that is the little boy. Uh, and little girls wore their hair short. Little boys wore their hair short. They parted in the center or combed it straight back or, or um, and the girls parted on, and the girls <laughs> the girls parted in the center and the boys parted on the side. The little guy in a little sailor dress here on the right is definitely a little boy. His, his hair is a little flyaway, but you can see it's parted on the side. The little girl in the gingham dress on the left, she's getting a little older. She's wearing her hair down and you can see that she's starting to grow her hair out because she's on her way to becoming a young lady. So she's going to grow her hair out a little bit. Facial Back to facial hair for men. 
Oh, again, you can see these guys have long hair, but again, long hair means like down to your ears or down to your jawline. It's not, with very few exceptions, you do not see big old hipstery long hair on uh, on guys. Uh, mostly clean shaven. Uh, I didn't. I, should, I didn't put any images up of guys in the 18th century. But think of George Washington. Think of Thomas Jefferson. They don't have mustaches and beards. It just generally wasn't a fashion for men to have facial hair in the Rev War in the 18th century. You had uh, certain military classes like uh, the Hussars or something that that were known for having elaborate mustaches. But that was a very specific thing for, for them. 1840s, you have men mostly clean shaven until we get to the Crimean War in the 1850s. And that's when you start to see facial hair on men. And it can be anything from just a mustache. It can be a beard, beard only with no mustache, or it can be both. And there's a little bit more variety going on at that point. Uh, getting towards the mid-century for the uh, 19th century, women's hair starts to go wide. The skirts start to go wide. Think uh, Civil War, big old crinoline hoop skirts. The whole point is everything goes wide because you want your waist to look small. So let's make the hair wide too. And again, look at all these center parts. Center, 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 center. <clears throat> so that is awesome. Until we get to the late 19th century, turn of the century, Edwardian era, and all of a sudden you start to get some sporty younger guys who are going to be a little daring, and they're going to part their hair in the center now. So these are these these uh, football guys are part of that new fashion craze for guys parting their hair in the center. Before before then, you really don't see that. So this this image of these football guys is from right around 1900. And they are very fashion forward. It's very young. You're not going to see a guy, <clears throat> an older guy doing that because that's too girly. But they're having fun. So, so now women's hair stops being straight out to the side. And guys are parting their hair in the center. And women are just swirling their hair all over the place. It's up. It's poofy. You're adding rats, which is balls of hair. You're adding wonderful things to get volume. Again, you want volume because everything is about making the waist look small. So you have a big poofy sleeves, you have big poofy hair, you have a big poofy skirt and a little waist. And this is part of it. And I love 1890s hair. It's, it's just, there's so many different ways to do it. It gets big, like so many things, it goes to extremes. It gets bigger and bigger. And here we see in this uh, French magazine page, the art of adding in extra hair so you can have more volume. You've got rats, you've got switches, you've got basically early hair extensions that you put in so you can achieve that big Gibson girl, lovely, big old hair. And what ends up happening is your hair is so big and the hats get so big. They're just wonderful. This is the era of giant long hat pins because you have to have a, you know, a 25 inch hat pin to go through that big old wheel hat through all that hair and then out the other side of your hair and into the hat to anchor that hat in place. And also what it means is these wheel hats are basically floating on top of a huge cloud of hair. They're not touching your scalp. These hats are floating there, anchored into hair that's anchored to you. It's this huge construction to the point where these hat pins are so amazing that the image on the right is basically showing women how to do self-defense by using their hat pins as a deadly weapon. And uh, that's a wonderful use for a hat pin. Here's a cartoon showing uh, the extremes that the wheel hats got to where, uh, you know, 50 years before this, the cartoons were about how giant the skirts were, so you couldn't get close enough to a woman to talk to her. Well, now it's the hat. This, the dress silhouette is very slim, and the hats are huge. Fashion loves to over-exaggerate. The hats come down a little bit in the 1910s, a different style. This is a nice little toque, but again, you can see how it's floating on her hair. The actual circumference of the inside of the hat and the hat band is much larger than the size of her head. It needs to be big enough to go around the hair without squishing it. And hair, this is about the poofiest that women's hair gets. It's just beautiful. 
And then, oh, I, I had to throw this image. And this is from Titanic again in the 1910s. And this is Rose Bur Burkhart, Burkhold. Anyway, Rose from Titanic. And I think they really nailed that look. This is the biggest that women's hats really get. And the over that poofy hair. And they just nailed the look. I just thought that was really nice. So now we get into the 19 teens and we're headed, we're in the late 19 teens. We're still, we still have big hair. It's sitting a little lower on the head and farther back and we're heading for the twenties. Uh, this is think, think we're just in uh, world war one heading towards the end of world war one. And we're heading for the twenties and everyone thinks everyone in the twenties had, had flapper hair and bobbed hair. And that's not the case. Women had always had long hair. And they didn't just cut their hair off overnight. And there's a cute little O. Henry story called Bernice Bobs Her Hair. And they made a, a little short film uh, years ago starring, this is Shelley Duvall and Bud Court there in the second image. And basically on a dare, this, this young lady who is kind of socially awkward to try and become popular, she bobs her hair. And it's a big deal. You didn't do that. What you did was oh, well, all the really fast girls and the loose girls and the flappers who are not nice girls. A flapper was basically like the punks of their era, the super high fashion saucy girls. They would bob their hair, but everyone else would do like this young lady in the lower left-hand corner. You would dress your hair up so that from the front, it looked bobbed, but really you still had long hair and it was in a low bun on the back. Well, Bernice goes ahead and cuts her hair off. And like so many girls, and, <clears throat> and it eventually, more girls did it so you get this shorter shorter hair now the volume of your hair has gone way down and this enables a new hat style which is the cloche and the gal in the red hat here is wearing a cloche hat it's a cloche is basically a bell-shaped thing that you put over something and all of a sudden hats are sitting lower they're down on the forehead um, and it's a, it's a whole different look than this giant thing floating on a cloud of hair now the hats are right jammed down on your head and that's a whole different ball of cheese. And then after the 20s comes the 30s. Women start growing their hair back out a little bit. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's still very close to the head. Styled, if you're doing fancy hair, it's pin curls and jerry curls and very close to the head. It's a little saucier. It's a little more fun. And that is 1930s hair. And then we get into the 40s. This is, I think, after the, 18, after the Edwardian era. This is one of my favorite eras for hair. This is the era of super classy hair. You can wear it up. You can wear it down. Rolled away from the face. The face is clear of hair. After the, some of the bobs with spit curls on the sides of the face. Now the hair is up. Even if it's down, it's dialed. It's smooth. It's it's beautiful but you know not everybody wore their hair down you got Hedy Lamar again here on the left she's got her hair up in braids again um and and oh and also starting in the probably in the 19 teens that center part only for women is starting to loosen up and you can part your hair kind of wherever you want anymore it's still considered normal for women to part their hair in the center but you can do whatever you want braids uh the gal in the middle is Veronica Lake she uh, was the originator of a kind of anomalous hairdo in the 40s because she ended up developing, that's her also on the very right, the blonde, with that swooping hair down over her eye. And she, she, that was her iconic look. And of course, when you have a celebrity who does something cool like that, all the young girls want to copy it. Unfortunately, now we're in wartime and a lot of these girls are working in factories. And... Finally, factory managers and floor managers had to say, honey, you got to put your hair up. You can't come into work with your hair down over one eye and go work on heavy machinery. It's not going to not going to fly. So Veronica Lake and her there are cartoons. There are Warner Brothers Bugs Bunny cartoons making fun of this hairdo. It was very, very iconic. Then we get into the 50s and all of a sudden women's hair starts getting short again. Uh, it's still styled. It's still curled. It's still dressed. But um, I like to call it the era of old lady hair, because when I was a little kid in the 60s, all of the grown up ladies and grandmas were doing their hair like this. 
because it was fashion forward from 10 years ago. And, and you tend to hold on to the fashions of that you were popular in your 20s. And so these women were teens and 20s and the 50s. And so that's how they were going to do their hair. The chrysanthemum haircut comes in and we get all kinds of stuff. I'm, I'm not a big fan of 50s hairdos by, in general um, because I think of them as old lady hair, but that's just me. This is a couple of screen grabs from The Parent Trap. And that's Maureen O'Hara, wonderful Maureen O'Hara. And even as a little kid, she starts out as this New York socialite with this beautiful updo, super classy. And then to show that she's loosening up and she's becoming more free thinking, she gets her hair cut short and gets basically an old lady haircut. And to me, I always thought, oh, now she looks older and dowdier and frumpier. She doesn't look more loose and free. But that's me with my 60s, 70s mindset looking at that. And to somebody in the 50s, she would have seemed all saucy and fresh. Uh, you see that in the movie Roman Holiday with uh, Audrey Hepburn. And was it Gary Cooper? I think. Anyway, Roman Holiday. She's a, a princess from some unknown European country, a young girl. And she has beautiful long hair up in braids with her little crown on top. And at some plate, point, she escapes from court life and goes goes AWOL running around Rome. And one of the things she does is she goes into a barber shop and has her hair cut short with her cute little Audrey Hepburn bangs and a little flip on the side. And it's a really cute little pixie haircut. But I'm like, oh, she cut off her pretty long hair. But for the purposes of that story, it symbolizes her breaking free of the constraints that are being placed on her and being young and fresh and fashion forward. So remember the time period that you're writing in for that kind of thing. Now we go into the 60s. In 1963, an epic sandal picture came out, Cleopatra starring Elizabeth Taylor as the sultry queen of Egypt. And I'm pretty sure that that movie is responsible for generations, a couple generations of women getting into bouffant hairdos because it's basically this uh, screen grab of Elizabeth Taylor doesn't show the one I was looking for, but there are a couple of, of scenes in the movie where it's basically the bouffant with the flip popularized by actresses like Marlo Thomas later on and whatnot, but it's that teased out beautiful fluffy helmet hair is what I like to think of it as because that hair ain't going anywhere. It's you, There's so much hairspray involved to get that look and so much styling. Apparently, to if you went to a, a salon to get a bouffant like the woman on the right there, that was a two-day process where they prepared your hair, they set your hair, and then you came back the next day and they teased it out or did whatever. And uh, so that's the bouffant hairdo. Um, it like I say, oh, here we've got a, a hairspray ad on the right. Just showing, you got to nail that thing down. But this was very, very popular in very many ways. This, this teased out, fluffy, big hair bouffant. We haven't seen hair this big since the 1910s. It was the, the bouffant flip was sort of iconically popularized by Jackie Kennedy, uh, who also managed to prompt a resurgence in hats for women. Somehow we'd lost wearing hats in, in the 50s. Well, actually women did wear hats a lot in the 50s, but she was sort of the last vestige of wearing hats and gloves when you go out, if you want to be properly dressed. Not everybody in the 60s did a bouffant hairdo. Here's a young lady on the right you might recognize. Her name is Cher. And she, for years, for decades, her signature look was just long straight hair, sometimes with bangs, sometimes without. But it wasn't until the, I don't know, the late 80s that she started curling her hair. So that's that look. Uh, speaking of the Kennedys, with President Kennedy, we saw the, basically the exit of hats for men. He was the first American president to appear officially in public with nothing on his head. He did not wear hats. And all of a sudden, guys just stopped wearing hats. And I, for one, think that's a sad thing because I think everybody should wear a hat. So there's that. Now we get into the 70s. Everybody wanted to look like Farrah Fawcett. All the girls wanted to look like Farrah Fawcett with her iconic 
tousled, layered blowout. Unfortunately, most young girls didn't realize that you have you can't just curl it. You have to actually tease it out too. So you end up with the sausage flip around your head or the sad little flip on the right. And those are those are what the girls in my high school looked like. Basically, they were trying to be Farrah Fawcett, but they ended up with the sausage roll. <clears throat> and then for men, it was the dawn of the mullet. Short in front, long in back, party all the time. The picture on the right is basically a mullet for women called a shag haircut. Um, it was more complicated than you'd think. There's a lot of teasing that goes into making that. In the 80s, we had weird top ponytails. We had uh, crazy frizzy perms came in. Uh, there was a trend for a some short haircuts, including the Dorothy Hamill. She was a popular figure skater in the 80s. My sister had a Dorothy Hamill haircut. The problem with the Dorothy Hamill wedge cut is it only looks good when you're spinning around on the ice. When you're not spinning, it just lays flat against your head and looks boring and terrible. And then the 90s. If you had curly hair, you straightened it. If you had straight hair, you crimped it. You could get away with a lot of crazy stuff. And if you were a guy, these kind of Edwardian long on top haircuts came in fashion, only unlike the Edwardian era where they slicked them back and looked stylish in the 90s, guys just had floppy hair on top, floppy, floppy. And that's okay. <clears throat> and today, it's kind of whatever you want to do. Uh, you can look like a hot mess if you want. Or you can uh, style your hair up beautiful. And basically, if you put your hair up and look nice, people think you're retro. <laughs> oh, so that's that's today. Um, let's go through a couple of some terminology and some generalities. The thing on the left that's U-shaped is a hairpin. The thing on the right that everyone calls a hairpin is not a hairpin. It's a bobby pin. Bobby pins are for hair bobs. Uh, in the 20s, and they were a way to pin those pin curls and do do some things. I mean, they're handy, but they're not a hairpin. When when we're talking hairpins and people pinning up their hair throughout the ages, we're talking metal or bone or tortoise shell, like the one down in the center here. The things on the right, they're, they should be a little bit larger to be to scale, but they're also a kind of a hairpin or a hair stick where you would use those to secure your bun. I should have pulled some out to stick in my hair, but but like. Here's a hairpin. It's a tortoiseshell hairpin. It is holding up my hair. I also have metal ones in here. And you can see I like these big ones here because they actually, they actually do a job on long hair. So uh, also we want to dispel the myth of she pulled out one hairpin and all her hair fell down. I don't have super thick hair. But there's two hairpins. Um, here's another couple of hairpins. Let's see, did I get them all? Okay, oh, wait. Oh, look, this is holding my front hair up. Oh, wait, nope, and this is holding my back hair up. I didn't just pull out one pin and all the hair fell down. It took a little doing. So if you're going to write that in a, in a book, she better, she better have like a hair stick, like an... Like today, you, you can do these fun little hairdos with a hair stick, and you can pull that out and have all your hair fall down. But if she's in the 18th century or the 19th century or early 20th century, and you want her hair to fall down in a romantic scene, uh, be careful of how you write that to make it realistic. Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. Let's see. Tools, brushes, combs, irons, curling irons go way back. Of course, they didn't have electricity in the early 19th century and before that. And so you would take your, your curling iron, which was just an iron, sometimes with a clamp, sometimes just a rod. You'd heat it on a fire or on a stovetop over in a lamp. There's a cute scene in the movie Tombstone. Tombstone? No, Silverado, sorry, where the Jeff Goldblum character goes to... I'm getting my movies all mixed up. Anyway, he goes, somebody goes to visit their sister, not Jeff Goldblum. I'm so mixed up. Um, anyway, uh, Danny Glover goes to visit his, 
his sister who's working as a prostitute and she's sitting at her dressing table and she's got a hot iron and she's heating it in. She's got the chimney off of her oil lamp and she's heating her, her curling iron in the flame from the oil lamp. I always thought that was a nice touch. Uh, uh, again, if, if you want hairstyles with volume, you might have to add some. Here's a, a illustration from the 18, late 1860s, early into the 70s, when hair stopped becoming wide and started getting tall, showing all the little switches and the fake hair that you could add into your hairdos. I know we're going to be running out of time soon, so I have to be careful so we can get to questions. Uh, uh, let's see. Here's uh, some references for you if you want to look at historic hair tutorials and things like that. YouTube is a gold mine. Uh, just recently, this first one, Warriors Long and Short Hair. It's actually a guy with who's of Indian, as in subcontinent, extraction, who does reenacting, talking about warriors and long hair in history. Uh, so his he goes by Metatron on YouTube. He's got some great stuff. Um, a few, number of years ago, I filmed a friend of mine doing 16th century hair taping. There's a link to that there or a, a URL for that. And then uh, just for channels that have great hair stuff, Janet Stevens does historical hairdressing. She does a lot of ancient Greece and Rome and medieval stuff. And she actually sits a model down and does their hair using using reproduction period tools and showing you how you want to look like that Roman statue or that Greek statue or Empress Theodora or whatever, she she does it and shows you how to do it. There's another YouTube channel called Silvu Play, where it's spelled spelled like plated hair at the end. She does historical and theatrical hair. Some of her stuff, she does a lot of fantasy stuff too, but also hair tutorials on how to get period hairstyles. So you can see what goes into it. Those are kind of okay. Yeah, okay, thanks. So I'm just going at my notes here. Oh, if you can find a copy of it, uh, there's a book. Lola Montez was an interesting character in the mid to late 19th century. She was a woman of questionable moral character who claimed to be a woman of moral character. And she kind of kind of a gold digger, but she got a reputation as being a lady of quality somehow at the same time. But she wrote a book called The Arts of Fascinating and something other. I've got a copy of it somewhere. I should have found it before this. But half of it is basically a, a, a send up of manners, like a how to be a lady kind of thing. And she does it in a satirical way, basically saying things like don't cake on your makeup so terribly so that if you get close to a man, you get paint on him, you know, because there's actually some good advice in there. But she also has a lot of stuff in there on how to take care of your hair and dress it in the 19th century. Uh, we didn't. You should see uh, until the until the until we get indoor plumbing, basically, and hot and cold running water, bathing including hair washing, wasn't something that you just did on the spur of the moment. It took some planning and some doing. You Every day you washed, you did your little spit bath and you know other areas. But washing your hair, was you didn't wash your hair every day. For one thing, they weren't putting Aquanet and mousse and stuff in their hair. They were just dressing it with scented oils and things to keep it soft and hydrated. But you you wash your hair when it needs it. That might be once a month. Might be, you know, might be every couple of weeks if it's hot and sweaty. You don't know. So so what you did was one of the reasons that people kept their hair covered over time was you want to keep it clean. If you're out mucking out the hen house and there's dirty, filthy poo dust flying everywhere, you don't want it getting in your hair if you only wash your hair once a month. So you wear a scarf around your head. You wear a hat. You're out in the garden. You're bucking hay. You're whatever you're doing. You don't want that all in your hair because you don't wash your hair every night. So you cover it up. You keep. You wear a scarf. You wear a hat. This is why, for costume historians watching historical films, it drives us crazy when we see scenes of people out doing everyday stuff and they're not wearing a hat or some kind of hair covering because it just wasn't done. Everybody covered their hair, and there's no air conditioning up until fairly recently. So you're out in the hot sun and people spent more time outside than they do now. 
So you're out, you're out in the weather, you're going to wear a hat to keep the sun off your head. You're going to be a lot cooler if you cover your head. In the wintertime, same thing. You're going to be a lot warmer if you're wearing a nice cozy hat. You're covering your head. That the whole, I can't stress enough what a big deal the whole um, Jack Kennedy not wearing a hat as our president is because it's a big deal. You, you wore a hat. <clears throat> Um, I mean, when I was a kid, little bitty kid in the 60s, I remember going shopping with mom and grandma and grandma wore a hat and gloves. I had to wear stupid little Mary Jane shoes and a frilly dress just to go shopping at the mall at Frederick's. It was crazy. I hated it. Uh, heat and cold and stuff. You know, there's always room for style and fashion. Oh, even if most of your hair is covered most of the time, you can still do fun things. You look at paintings, you can see things that people did with their hair. So at, with that, who has questions? My, my screen went dark, but I can see. Yeah, I have no idea. I've never had an inclination to relax my hair. I always, I was one of the people who had straight hair and wanted curly hair. So I don't know. I'm guessing that is something that's going to come out in the 60s because this is that 60s is the first era in history that I can think of in the West here where one of the fashion trends was to have super long, straight, swingy hair like Cher. And if you didn't have that, you were sad if you wanted it. So, um, and also I think for black hair, you have a whole raft of other issues. This is why there's a whole separate black hair chunk at the drugstore and at the at the at the beauty supply place because they're definitely trying to relax and get smoother hair a lot of times. If you're not if you're not deliberately trying to do a fro, which are coming back, which is awesome. But if you're trying to straighten your hair, I think that and that's something that's gonna be, you know, uh, second half of the twentieth century thing. Excellent. Um, our next question is from Edge Dancer 7 who asks, what kind of hairspray was used to keep their hair up and how many hairpins were used? <laughs> as many as you need. I'm getting away with four today, um, but uh, my hair is very thin. <clears throat> uh, throughout history, again, Morgan Donner, I think her YouTube channel is just called Morgan Donner, M-O-R-G-A-N-D-O-N-N-A-R. She's got some great hair tutorials. She's got one where they deal with, um, uh, she, she actually ordered some reproduction bronze, bronze age, bronze age hair, hairpins um can uh you use sticks you use pins you use things called hair taping um that's not the image i wanted i wanted here's morgan doing hair taping and uh you could take uh and basically braid uh tapes or ties into your hair to hold them up or put it around the braid and then tie them up uh, that's a thing. That's a thing you can do. Uh, let's see. Sprays. As far as sprays go, you don't see a spray like a spritzy spray probably until again the 1940s. Before that, it's all stuff that you would smooth into your hair, whether it's bear grease or some kind of scented oil or um, pomades that have some kind of stiffener in them. There are people doing reproduction 18th century hairdressings on Etsy where you can get these. These um, lovely concoctions that have some kind of, there's powders. Think of the 18th century, everybody looks like they have gray hair. Well, that's powder. There's a, there's a lovely, there are scenes in movies. There's a movie called Ridicule, which is kind of a depressing movie, but it's an it's a 18th century film and it has a scene of the woman wearing the face shield and then they're blowing powder onto her hair to powder it, but she's got her face shield to protect her face so she doesn't get powder all up in her eyes and in her face. So there are all kinds of things you can do, and it just depends on where and when you are. Excellent. Um, are you still good to keep answering questions? I, I can keep going as long as we're allowed. All right. The, there isn't anything in this room for the next hour, so you can keep going as long as you want to go. Okay. So Our as, next, as when we run out of questions, we'll stop. <laughs> Our next question is from... Emily Martha Sorensen, who asks, 
Uh, we've talked about European hairstyles. Did Asian or African hairstyles follow similar trends? Were they did they change as dramatically as as the hairstyles that we've talked about? But with with black hair, because it's it can be di- more difficult to manage. But also with black hair, it obeys your commands. You can put it in a cool style, and it'll stay there. So if you look at um, the African continent, different cultures there, and you look at um, engravings like from the 19th century when explorers were going and discovering these people and doing images of them, and they document all these elaborate braids and things. Um, I don't know a lot about it. That's kind of out of my wheelhouse. But what I'm guessing is that in a lot of in a lot of the African tribal cultures, you had the men actually had fancier hairstyles. It's kind of like in the in the in the world of nature where the birds have the more colorful plumage because they want to attract a mate and they want to look awesome. So they'll have elaborate braids with little seashells in them and things and and do stuff depending on the culture. There's some cultures where they just plucked all the hair out. And that was considered manly. There are some cultures where you needed big hair to be, you know, it just depends. So you need to, that's an individual thing. As far as, as you get um, black hair going forward to today, uh, you look at the seventies and everybody was doing afros, but as was asked earlier about cream straighteners, once if women could figure out a way to straighten their hair and to look, because in the sixties, high fashion unfortunately, did not include black hair. So if you wanted a fashionable hairdo, you're, you're looking like Jackie Kennedy or something. And oh, oh great, I have I have kinky black hair. I can't do that. So I either have to iron it with flat irons and straighten it and then style it into my helmet hair, which they did. Or again, uh, chop it really super in a super short fro and wear wigs. And, and I think this is part of why... <clears throat> If you've got a girl, if you've got a girlfriend who has black or kinky hair, that kind of hair, she probably has a drawer full of of um, hair pieces and attachments for doing hairstyles because, and that just became part of of black culture. It's just assumed. I have a girlfriend who has, who uh, another friend of hers, is like I don't understand you white girls. How you, you know you think you think if you bought the hair, it doesn't count. It's like that's your hair. You bought it. You know, so. So there's that. Um, Asian hairstyles, Asia is a big place. There's lots of different Asia. Uh, again, there's a lot of, if you're lower caste working in the fields, again, you're covering your hair, simple hair styles that are pulled back uh, either. And they had a tendency in Asia to have long braids, but those were usually the men that had the long queue. And the women's hair was up. Again, she's out working. She's taking care of children. She's doing stuff. She's going to keep her hair covered with a headscarf or something. Uh, to this day in Japan, they have these cute little headscarves with visors to keep the, the sun out of your face. Um, that's very typical. You've got to cover your hair to keep it clean. Hair's, oh, go ahead. Lovely. Um, yeah, so the next question is from Joyo today. Or Joyo. <laughs> uh, was hairspray created specifically for hair or was it a byproduct of something else? That's a good question. Uh, that would take some research basically the main ingredient in what we consider hairspray today i think it's called acrylate it's some something acrylate and it's the same thing you know those bora nose strips that you put on to clean out your pores it's exact same ingredient it's just this this kind of water softenable stuff that sort of semi sets into a pol it's a polymer kind of thing polymerized kind of thing and then um peel it off your face but I don't know. It's like so many things. Like how did we how did we get silly putty? Well, they were trying to do something else and we ended up with silly putty. So I don't know. That that sounds like a good um James Burke sort of thing. But uh, basically all hairspray is kind of the same thing and with just varying degrees of hold. It's that acrylate, something acrylate. Awesome. Um Edge Dancer07 asks, how would you fit different hair colors and hairstyles f- for the personality of a character? Um, hmm. I, again, it depends where and when. We Like we talked about in the 1920s with Bernice bobbed her hair. You know, a nice girl in the early part of the 20s still had her long hair that she did up. The fast you know, forward, rich girls who didn't care what anybody thought of them and 
flew in the face of, of decency went ahead and did the bob uh and they were copying their their film stars their silent film stars like louise brooks um who was a you know a fashion icon of the time she she had the super the shingled really short bob in in back and then she's the classic with the super hard bangs the black hair and sometimes she did a little spit curl on the cheek but that whole uh and uh, speaking of black hair, uh, uh, the famous dancer, Gordon, Josephine, uh, banana dancer girl. Anyway, she was Baker, Josephine Baker. Uh, she was a nightclub dancer, a popular gal in the 20s. She ended up having to go to France to actually have a career because there was too much discrimination still in this country at the time. Now she could have done it, but back then. So she became big over there before she became big back here. And she had the jerry curled short, you know, black hair, but she ironed it into these beautiful jerry curls and sometimes with the little spit curl. And sometimes they would do little spit curls on the forehead. You've seen the pictures. And um, that's that would make your character more fashion forward, probably more upper class and more um, basically flying in the face of, of decency or, or morality or, or decorum. That's the word I'm looking for. Uh, you see this in Downton Abbey where you want to differentiate characters in the second or third season of Downton Abbey. We're getting into the twenties. And so the girls start wearing their hair. They don't cut their hair because this is sort of a conservative family, but they style it to look like it's bobbed at first. And then I think some of them cut their hair. I stopped watching that show after they killed off a certain character, but, but Maggie Smith's character, the Dowager Duchess, she still has the long hair in the Gibson girl hairdo for quite a while because that was what was fashionable when she was in her youth. And by golly, that's up. That's what she's going to wear. And that shows that she's older and she's a little more conservative in her dress. And then they have the American relative who comes to visit from New York. She's wearing the latest fashions. She's got her hair bobbed. She's got the little headband and the, and the 20s outfit. So that tells you something about her character. She's from a different country. She's a little more fashion forward. She, she's trying to be younger and a little flashier. So that can tell you, that can tell you a lot. Um, as far as hair color goes, if you want to do the personality of your character, just think it's a kind of a rule of thumb that if somebody's going out of their way to change their hair color into a crazy, like Queen Elizabeth making her hair red or you know, whatever, they're, they're trying to hold on to their youth. And there, there's a thing with... You have to be careful as as we as, especially as women as we get older. A lot of women tend to want to keep if they have dark hair, they want to keep it dark. So they keep dyeing it dark, sometimes darker and darker till it's almost black, but you're losing color in your face and so you just start looking like death on a cracker. I had an I had an aunt who did that when I was a kid and she always dyed her hair black and then she always looked terrible and pasty, but she wanted to look young and she didn't realize it was making her look worse. So like I'm getting, I'm getting gray in my hair. I used to hand in my hair. If I handed my hair now, it would turn bright orange because I'm getting so much gray in it. So I'm just letting it go. And it actually looks better now that I stopped coloring my hair. So um, it's, it's a personality thing. If you've got someone who's desperately clinging to their youth, you can have them be, continue to dye their hair or something like that. Excellent. We'll take one more question here. Uh, this is from Joyo. Uh, when did hair dye first appear? Oh, hair dye? Well, let's talk about henna. Henna is a is a, from a, a tree, a bush, a plant that grows in Mesopotamia and go, grows over over yonder in the cradle of civilization. And I'm guessing women were hennaing their hair back to the dawn of time. To this day, in Morocco, in um, Tunisia, you that's what you do. You henna your hair and you henna your hair once a month or whenever you do it. And it, not only does it shrink the cuticle and make it nice and smooth, but it makes it kind of orangey red. Uh, in ancient Egypt, they used the henna to dye the tips of not just their nails, but the whole tip of their finger. And that was uh, that was considered fashionable. And I think they were into black hair more. So they weren't hennaing their hair. But um, and of course, with the bog people, the bog bodies, you can't tell 
if they did because the bog has dyed their hair now. So we don't know. But I, I think it I think it goes back. Everybody wants something. I think if you're in Asia, they were probably using and I'd have to research this as you got older to keep that nice blue black hair color. I'm sure they put something on there. I know there's a there's a series of novels that I, I love by Elizabeth Peters with Amelia Peabody, Egyptian archaeologist. And as she gets older in the novels and she gets married, uh, she keeps it a secret, she thinks, from her husband. But she has a little dye bottle that she touches up her hair with to keep her raven locks. And uh, it, go it goes back um, with, with greater and lesser efficiency. There's a reason why in old lady houses when I was a kid, everybody had the little doilies on the back of the sofa and armchairs they call them anti-macassars or anti-macassars i don't know how you pronounce it well one of the, the 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 word macassar is it's a particular nut that you get oil from it was a hair oil and everybody dressed their hair with this anti-macassar oil and of course they lean back on the furniture and ruin the upholstery and uh, up until i don't know the 1930s probably hair dye was probably not super uh, fast henna henna is henna won't come off but other if you're putting if you're just doing touch-ups and things that would probably get on your clothes and on your furniture too so you'd have to be careful nowadays we've got wonderful stuff you can just go to the drugstore and get that's easy <clears throat> excuse me oh i see the comment about being in the caribbean in the 80s and the relaxing cream that sounds awful. <laughs> I remember my mom wanted me to have poofy hair when I was a little bitty kid in the 60s, and she gave me a perm. And all it did was make my hair frizzy. It just burned my hair. It, chemistry's come a long way. So, yeah, I, uh, anyway. Yeah. So, yeah, anybody else? Or we can all just fade away here. 